in the 50 days between Easter and Pentecost, we're taking a look at Easter practices. These are good habits for us to do to deepen our faith and our spiritual lives. Because faith isn't just something we have, it's something we do. And living our faith in God in our daily life takes practice. Sometimes we run into a challenge after Easter. After the 40 days of preparing for the life-changing reality of the resurrection during Lent, we may find that we're still slam busy at work or school or with all our commitments after Easter. We still find news and world events deeply disturbing. Still wake up in the morning with more anxieties than Alan Lee's. Even if the world isn't all that different after Easter, shouldn't we be? Engaging in Easter practices can help us in our spiritual transformation that God wants to give all of us. Today, let's look at the Easter practice of letting God in. By going to the Gospel of John to Jesus' resurrection meeting with his disciples. John tells us that on that Easter Sunday evening, Jesus, alive and well, met his gathered disciples, gave them his peace twice, thrilled them with bodily evidence of his real resurrection, gave them his mission and the gift of the Holy Spirit to carry out that mission, and also gave believing people the assured forgiveness of their sins. A whole lot happened on that first Sunday. Christian historian and theologian Diana Butler Bass points us to this evening encounter between Jesus and the disciples in the Gospel of John. Those verses that Jana just read are told sparingly in such a short passage, and they're often overlooked when the Easter story is read. We often jump to the following week when Jesus encounters Thomas again. We know him as Doubting Thomas. Jesus and Thomas talk together in that same room, and Thomas believes. But let's look today at that passage that Jana just read. Listen again to the word of God in John 20. When it was evening on that day, the first week, day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus was crucified, the disciples retreated to the room where they last gathered with Jesus, the place of their final Passover meal together. Mary found them on Easter morning and made her big announcement, I have seen the Lord. So what did those disciples do? They hid where they thought they wouldn't be found and locked themselves in. They were scared, really scared. And what scares them? the fear of the Jews. John's gospel lends itself to anti-Semitism, a particular kind of Christian bigotry directed toward Jews. The gospel of John was composed during a time that Christian believers felt themselves persecuted and powerless on the verge of extinction, which is a worldview that finds enemies everywhere. In recent decades, Many theologians and preachers have gone to great lengths to minimize the anti-Semitism of John's Gospel, a story that's full of references to the Jews. They remind us that when we hear texts that mention the Jews, those references really mean Jewish authorities who collaborated with the Romans rather than an entire religious ethnic group. Making that clarification is a good thing. Not all Jews persecuted Jesus. Many of them believed in him and followed him. But certain Jewish enemy sympathizers did. We have to be vigilant in challenging our ancestors in the faith who couldn't tell the story of Jesus without slurring the ones around him who didn't see him that way so we can combat the bigotry that sprouts in our own hearts in times of fear and anxiety. <clears throat> then we can let the gospel truly have its say without overlaying it with any kind of bigotry or prejudice. This is our hope. 
Goodness knows we don't need any more fuel for the fires of prejudice in these times. But what if the writer, in this case at least, really meant for fear of the Jews? Why wouldn't the author say Pilate's men are the Roman soldiers if the disciples were afraid of the authorities coming to get them? There are plenty of bad actors they might have feared. Why did John say for fear of the Jews? That's odd, given the fact that all the disciples locked in the room were Jews themselves. Were they afraid of their own people? Were they afraid of themselves? Maybe the plain meaning of this passage is fear of the Jewish authorities. But maybe the figurative meaning of the text is that the disciples were terrified of their own people, of their own self. The execution, the missing body, the empty tomb, the shocking message of Mary, they couldn't or wouldn't face it. They ran away. They locked themselves behind those doors. Why do we lock doors? We usually lock doors because we're afraid of the dark. The darkness outside and the darkness inside. In David White's poem, The Edge We Carry With You, the poet describes the edge as our fear of our truest self and our deepest longings, dreading our bodily passions and powers, terrorized by both our own life and our own death. So we close a door on it, locking ourselves in against this darkness, bolting the door against ourselves. We'll be safe inside, we think, better than living on that edge. The darkness is really just obscuring the light. What if the locked door isn't protecting us but holding us prisoner? What if the door has to be open to what awaits on the other side? Not death, but life. John's Gospel reports that Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. And on the third day he rose and lives. The disciples were terrified. They didn't know what to make of all that, so they locked themselves in. On the evening of Easter, they entombed themselves. The historian John nudges us to see that when we lock ourselves behind doors for fear of our neighbors or ourselves, we turn that feasting room into a tomb. The edge of darkness, the edge of all our fears, can also be a kind of death and burial. Slam that door, bolt it shut. We're afraid, afraid of the dark. Cut off from others, we shudder in the night. Jesus came and stood in the middle of them and said, Peace be with you. He showed them his hands and sighed. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I sent you. Maybe Jesus was at that locked door. Not those whom the disciples feared would harm them. They feared what they thought was at the door, the darkness of death. And they missed seeing the light under the threshold. I wonder if Jesus tried to get in that room in some other way, by knocking maybe when he was ignored by his friends who were gathered there shivering and with fright. Only then did he resort to miracle. A bodily, resurrected Jesus comes to them through locked doors, the edge of darkness, imprisoning them in fear, is now revealed in the light. All they had been able to see before Jesus showed up that night was their dashed hopes. That locked up room was the end of the line for them, so they thought. They've had the breath knocked out of them. They were having trouble remembering how to breathe. If you've ever had a panic attack, you know what fear can do to you. The pounding heart, the cold sweat, crushing anxiety all over you. It can make you think that you're dying. It's the same thing if you've ever had the breath knocked out of you. Breathlessness can come to us in lots of ways. Bad asthma, hard falls, heart failure, 
sudden violence. However it happens, no breath means no life. There's no way forward without breath. Somehow Jesus knew that regaining their breath was what they needed more than anything that night in that locked room. That they had to be able to breathe before they could hear anything else. So he gave them some old school divine CPR. Gave them his own breath to bring them back to life. Like God creating humankind in Genesis all over again. Only this time the breath came from Jesus. He breathed on them and their fear turned to joy. That first Easter night, Jesus' tomb was empty. But the disciples' house was closed with the doors locked tight. They left Jesus' empty tomb and entered their own tombs of fear. They locked themselves in. The doors of tombs are always locked from the inside. What keeps you in the tomb these days? Maybe, like the disciples, it's fear. Maybe you have every reason to be afraid, because life for you as you go through the world isn't very safe. Maybe your tomb is filled with grief and loss, or questions and doubts, or anger and resentment. Maybe the wounds in you are so deep it doesn't seem worth the risk to step outside or to open up to new possibilities and change. Some days it's easier and safer to lock the doors and avoid the troubling people and situations in our lives. Sometimes we just want to run away and hide, not deal with the reality of our lives or the world. But every time we shut the doors of our lives and our minds and our hearts, we imprison ourselves. For every person, event, or idea we lock out, we lock ourselves in. Jesus is willing to enter those locked places in our lives. He comes Eastering in us. With our permission, he steps into our closed lives and closed minds and hearts. Standing among us, he offers peace and breathes new life into us. And his breath carries us through the day and through our lives. So let's all of us, faithful, fearful ones, take a breath. And let's pray. Dear God, help us open the locked doors of our lives to you. So Jesus can stand right in the middle of us and give us the gift of his peace and the gift of his spirit. Risen Lord Jesus, fill us with your spirit so we can represent and present you to the world. In this season and all seasons, may we fulfill your mission by giving Jesus away to others so that they may believe that he really is risen, that he really is Lord. 